Productions for IEEE USA in Washington, D.C. This is the September 30th, 2021 IEEE USA Legislative Update. Coming to you for, uh, live from Washington, D.C., where we have an absolutely perfect fall day. Um, for those of you who never lived in Washington, there are about four weeks of the year when it's actually pleasant to live in D.C. Two in the spring and two in the fall, and this is one of them. So we're starting from a very optimistic, happy place, which helps when you're dealing with Congress. Little history to start with, uh, September 30th, anniversary of the first use of anesthetics. Uh, Dr. William Morton used anesthesia to, with, to extract a tooth back in 1846. It took about 30 to 40 years before anybody else started using anesthesia for surgery, but it was, a, it was still a valid start. Uh, and it is worth noting that on this day in 1998, the U.S. ran a budget surplus for the first time in 30 years. That budget surplus lasted until 2001, and is now very much gone and we do not expect it back anytime soon so we can look back fondly to 1998 when we did the u.s government did in fact bring in a little more money than it spent uh if you're paying at all attention to the news you know basically what's going on in washington dc um we have a um a couple really big things that we've been talking about for the last several weeks that are really active and there's a lot of noise and there's a lot of maneuvering about them um, but it's not at all clear all of that noise is relevant uh, and so I want to take a minute to kind of talk through what's happening and, and give you a sense of what's important and what's not what what's just noise and political uh, uh, gnashing of teeth and what is actually substantive for the country first of all the state of things Rumor has it we have a deal on a continuing resolution that would fund the budget through December. Uh, House and Senate leaders announced it this morning. The House has already voted on it. The Senate is supposed to vote on it this afternoon. If everything goes according to plan, we should have a, a government, excuse me, that is funded until the end of the year. By the way, <clears throat> this particular update has been uniquely entertaining to write because I have to keep updating it every couple of minutes. For example, uh, the infrastructure bill is apparently on for this afternoon. The infrastructure bill is the trillion dollar bill passed by the Senate that is now sitting in the House. Speaker Pelosi had committed to having a vote on the infrastructure bill on Monday. That got bumped to today. This morning when I got into work, the plan was that that bill would be voted on on Monday. But about 15 minutes ago, Nancy Pelosi said that the vote would happen today. We'll see if that's still true at the end of this presentation. Um, but <clears throat> at some point in the next few days, we should have a vote on the infrastructure bill, maybe. It's not clear that that bill will pass the House. Uh, there are a substantial number of Democrats who have said they will vote against it. There are some Republicans who will be voting for it. I don't know if anybody really knows how that vote's going to go, although Nancy Pelosi is pretty good at counting votes. Uh, and she's unlikely to bring it up for a vote only to have it fail. Uh, so if she brings up for a vote today, it will probably pass. Not by much, but it doesn't need to pass by much. It just needs to pass. The big 3.5, a little bit more than that, probably reconciliation bill is not ready for a vote. Um, <clears throat> it hasn't really been written yet. Uh, we have some versions of it and some pieces of it, but it's not one coherent legislative thing yet. Um, and the $3.5 trillion bill does not have a way forward in the Senate. Uh, Senators Manchin and Sinema have both said they will oppose the $3.5 trillion bill. No Republican has indicated they'll support it, so it's not going to pass the Senate. Um, <clears throat> unfortunately, there's no clear path for a different bill to go back to the House. In other words, if the $3.5 trillion bill it would probably pass the House. If it goes to the Senate and it is changed, enough Democrats in the House have said they won't support anything but a $3.5 trillion bill, that it, a, a different bill couldn't pass the House. Republicans in both the House and the Senate are unlikely to support either bill, which gives the Democrats the teeniest of margins. Have no idea how this is going to uh, be reconciled, how it's going to work its way out, but this basic dynamic um, is what's really fueling all the energy and all the noise in Washington. Uh, and lingering in the background, and less and less in the background every day, is the debt ceiling. 
Uh, the Treasury has estimated that the U.S. government will run out of money on October 15th, November 2nd, somewhere in that range. Uh, and so the deadline is probably around October 15th for Congress to raise the debt ceiling. So that's what's happening. <clears throat> Let's talk a little bit about which of these things matter, which of these things are real, which of the debates are about substantive policy discussions dealing with legislation that will mean something to most Americans, and what is noise, what is negotiations through the press, and what is positioning for a real discussion that will happen down the line. <clears throat> the budget, federal budget debate I don't think is real uh, in the sense that they're going to fund it. And everybody knew they were going to do a CR back over the summer. We kind of expected they'd do it before today since the budget has to be done by midnight or the CR has to be done by midnight tonight. Um, <clears throat> but they'll, they'll, they'll fund it. They'll get it done. If they don't manage to get it done today, and it looks like they will get it done today, but if they don't, the, the government will shut down tomorrow, but it, it'll be a few hours maybe into the weekend before they fund it. And shutting down the government for a day really isn't that big a deal. Federal government gets a day off. They'll get paid for it. Government services are a little bit disrupted, but not massively. Now, if the budget debate lingers, if they can't get the CR done into next week, into the following week, then it will become a real problem for the country. But I don't think that's going to be the case. Uh, the reconciliation debate is not real <coughs> um, because the bill does not exist. So we're not having a debate about real text. What's happening is I think most people in Washington have now recognized that the $3.5 trillion bill is not going to pass. It's not going to be a thing. And so what the various pieces of Congress and pieces of the government are now doing is they're positioning themselves and their faction in a way that they think will strengthen their negotiating hand when the real negotiation over a somewhat smaller reconciliation bill starts. And so most of the noise we're now seeing is really negotiating. Uh, or more accurately, positioning for a negotiation that everybody expects down the line. <clears throat> the infrastructure bill is real. That bill, you know, it's written, it's passed the Senate, it's big. A tr it's a trillion dollar bill. That's a big bill. And it will do a lot of good to a lot of people. There's, as we've talked about before, a, a bunch of sections that IEEE members will appreciate on AI, on the electrical grid, on cybersecurity, a lot of other provisions that will just help America in general. The problem with the infrastructure bill is, is that it's been sucked into the reconciliation positioning, uh, which has made it difficult to get this bill passed, even though it has more than enough support in Congress on its merits. More on that in a minute. Uh, the debt ceiling debate is currently not real, but could become very painfully real soon. And what I mean by that is Congress has about two weeks to get the debt ceiling increased. Okay, the, the arguments for the first week are fine. I mean, they have a week to get this done. All the, the the negotiating and yelling at each other that's happening now doesn't change the fact that the debt ceiling is going to be increased, and we know that. Uh, and so they're not really arguing about substance, they're arguing about politics. The problem is if they don't get that done in a week or so, it will start to have some fairly severe um, consequences for global financial markets. And when global financial markets start to become unstable, bad things happen. Markets are already unstable because of inflation, because of the jobs numbers, and because of the argument going on in Washington. Uh, the closer we get to October 15th, the worse that's going to get. So they do have some time before this becomes a crisis. But they have a lot less time than they really should. Uh, and so they really need to get that done soon before it becomes real and starts you know, hurting people. So to put the reconciliation bill into context, I want to use a metaphor that was given to me by one of my colleagues, Anne-Marie Kelly. Uh, she works right down the hall from me for the Computer Society. And she compared the reconciliation bill to a black hole. And I think that's about right. The reconciliation bill is so massive. I mean, $3.5 trillion, maybe a little more than that, is a humongous amount of money. And within the reconciliation bill, there's four, five, six, maybe more, depending on how you count, major legislative initiatives that could be massive bills on their own. And so the size of the, the bill, the size of the programs, the implications of a bill this big are just sucking in other debates. The infrastructure bill, which is a huge bill, it's a trillion dollars, but it's much smaller than the reconciliation bill. 
uh, a number of other smaller bills are getting pulled into the fighting and the jockeying over the reconciliation bill. And to extend the metaphor a little bit, we're waiting to find out where the bottom of this black hole is. Yes, I know black holes don't really have a bottom, but this one does, because at some point, the reconciliation debate has to be finished. Either they need to come up with a bill that then becomes law or doesn't, or the debate has to go away, which will allow all these other bills to spin off. Infrastructure might get out of the gravity well being created by reconciliation today or next week, but as other things get pulled in, it's going to consume more and more of Congress's time. The debt ceiling bill is already pulled into this, and that needs to be spun off because uh, I don't see them fixing reconciliation in the next week or so. Uh, and so this is where we are now. The, the size and the massiveness of reconciliation is just distorting all other political debates, making it very difficult for Congress to get much done. But they are moving ahead on a few things. Talk about reconciliation. We do have pieces of the text for the House bill. <clears throat> Some of the highlights, uh, five billion for regional technology centers. This is similar, but not the same as what is in the Endless Frontier Act. It could become the Endless Frontier Act if the language was tweaked a little bit. <clears throat> Excuse me. Um, five billion is good. IEEE-USA prefers the Endless Frontier Act, but what's in reconciliation is fine. House was never as excited about the regional technology hubs as Chuck Schumer in the Senate was. So if reconciliation ever makes it to the Senate, I expect Senator Schumer's people will fix this and we'll work with them to get that to happen. Uh, reconciliation has an additional 7.5 plus billion uh, for NSF research, which is good, although a lot of legislation bopping around with big increases in funding for NSF, which is good and we support, but you end up with some institutional constraints in all this. You know, agencies can spend money productively only up to a point. And if you dump too much into an agency budget too quickly, they can't spend it all, and NSF might be reaching that point, but you know, we'll still take the money. The reconciliation bill does not have language for the tech directorate in NSF. It doesn't preclude it, but it doesn't specifically include it, which is okay because there's language in the infrastructure bill that does that. Uh, and as long as they both move or just infrastructure moves, we're fine. But we are excited about the tech directorate. Uh, reconciliation has $1.1 billion uh, for DOE uh, demonstration projects, particularly for alternative energy projects, uh, including uh, funding for domestic solar panel supply chain development, uh, which is a fancy way of investing in the production of solar panels and components used to make solar panels in the United States. This is smaller, but similar to the CHIPS Act on semiconductors, which we'll get to in a minute. Uh, there's $105 million for a new Manufacturing USA initiative focusing on semiconductors, which is kind of a mini CHIPS Act. Uh, the CHIPS Act language is, is again in the infrastructure bill uh, and will need to be in the budget bill uh, whenever they get around to passing the fiscal 2022 budget, uh, but it is not really in the reconciliation bill. Speaking of the CHIPS Act, uh, there was a meeting between the EU and US uh, earlier this week to discuss the global chip shortage and supply chain disruptions in general. Um, the two, well, governments, the EU and US, are discussing ways to repair uh, damaged global supply chain, which is kind of euphemism diplomatic language for how do we take manufacturing out of China and move it into our countries. Uh, the two governments are also trying to avoid a subsidy war. Uh, that's when one government decides to dump money into a particular industry to strengthen it in their country. And so another country does the exact same thing to pull it back to their country and you end up with this ratcheting up of subsidies, which ends up wasting an enormous amount of taxpayer money and not actually doing much else. Um, Europe has expressed concerns about the CHIPS Act, although in fairness, Europe does the CHIPS Act. I mean, they do this stuff all the time. Um, but there is a concern that if the United States invests heavily in our domestic uh, computer chip production capacity, Europe will be under pressure to do the same thing, and that can get very, very expensive. Uh, they were talking about possible joint efforts to promote chip manufacturing in the United States and Western Europe, or Europe rather, um, rather than just the United States and just Europe. That's hard to pull off, but makes a lot of sense logistically. 
Hovering over this conversation is more news coming out of China that because of political unrest, because of COVID, and because of energy supply problems, China's production capacity is being hammered. And any global supply chain that goes through China is likely to be disrupted. Um, experts, by the way, if you haven't heard this already, are warning that supply of Christmas presents is likely to be disrupted this year. So they are recommending that you do your Christmas shopping early. I'm not going to take that advice. I'm going to do it right after Thanksgiving like I always do. Uh, but smarter people suggest that that might not be a good idea. A uh, quick little update on immigration. Uh, the par Senate parliamentarian has rejected Senate leaders' plan B on immigration. You may recall that originally the reconciliation bill was supposed to have a fairly large section on immigration reform. Uh, parliamentarian said no. Reconciliation can only be used for budget items, and immigration is not a budget item. So Senate leaders went back, Senate Democrats went back, and came up with a new way of doing basically the same thing. And I got to think they knew it wasn't going to work. The parliamentarian's concern was that immigration is fundamentally not a budget matter. It's an immigration matter. And therefore, it can't go into reconciliation bill. Doing immigration differently is still immigration. And frankly, it wasn't too surprising that the parliamentarian said, no, this second plan, plan B, is also not going to work. On the heels of this decision, Senate leaders, particularly Senator Durbin and Menendez, have both said that they will not move a green card bill without an amnesty provision attached to it. They weren't specific about what amnesty needed to be, but presumably it includes legalizing a large number of people who are not in this country legally at the moment. Uh, and that ends, <clears throat> excuse me, speculation over doing a high-scale green card bill through reconciliation or through anything else. Unfortunately, this is basically where this country has been for the past 20 years. Congressional leaders have said, until we can fix everything, we're not going to fix anything. But they can't fix everything, so we end up doing nothing. Uh, and it is a frustrating place to be, but it does look like, at least for another year, that's where we're going to sit. Uh, small thing that popped up this week, uh, the administration announced a new EB-3 visa category. Uh, EB-3s are a weird little, tiny little program of temporary visas, very similar to the H-1B. Uh, but they're only, the EB-3s in this case can only be used by people from Portugal. We have a couple of these small little temporary programs. We have one for Chile, for Singapore, and now we have one for Portugal. Why those three countries? I honestly don't know. Um, but it, I, I mention this for two reasons. First of all, IEEE-USA does not support temporary visas. We don't like these programs. However, we're not going to do much about it because it's very small. We're not seeing, uh, there's only 10,000 visas in the category, and it's grossly undersubscribed. That is, the number of applicants coming from Portugal is far less than 10,000, so they're not all going to be used. Um, and it's, this isn't where the problem is within the H-1B program. Um, but it does highlight why it's so hard to do immigration reform, because the U.S. immigration system has lots and lots of these little niches, these little cubby holes, special little visa programs designed to solve a particular problem for particular people from a particular place at a particular time, which don't actually make sense within the broader context of immigration law. But because you have all these little things, and in fact a large amount of immigration is done through all of these little things, it makes it very difficult to deal with the system as a whole because the system is such a mess. Mentioned last week that Congress has been plowing through amendments to the NDAA, uh, National Defense Authorization Act, they pass every year, um, is kind of moving, and it looks like it is no, has not yet been pulled into reconciliation's gravity, though that can change. Um, a couple, at the moment, this year's NDAA is almost entirely focused on the military. The, the extraneous kind of extra provisions that just couldn't get passed anywhere else have been mostly left out. Uh, but within that, there are some amendments that are useful and uh, worth noting to IEEE members. Um, there's a, a ton of provisions in there on AI technology, cybersecurity technology, workforce training, purchasing, um, but all within a military context. 
So there's rules on how the military can use AI, uh, uh, programs to help the military produce AI, um, but it's it's not for the broader uh, uh, society. Things like you know weaponized drones and drone training and recruiting uh, people to fly drones. Um, speaking of which, several sections in the NDAA deal with government, specifically military, hiring people with technical skills. Um, computers and engineering in particular. Uh, obviously, if you want to recruit AI experts to run the Defense Department's AI systems, you generally don't want to do that through the, the normal recruiting system the military uses. You don't want to recruit those kids out of high school. You want someone with a college degree. But you can't commute, uh, recruit someone out, coming out of college with a degree in you know, cybersecurity through the regular military recruitment process and more specifically through the regular military pay grades. Uh, and so the military has actually been very good at creating alternative paths to hire and alternative pay scales and alternative promotion processes or uh, uh, channels uh, for people with technical skills. The NDAA, as amended, would build on that to provide even more options for people with technical backgrounds to work for the military. Uh, there are several provisions pertaining to standards, as we've talked about in the past. Um, most to deal with international standards development efforts, which involve governments negotiating with each other. That's not really what IEEE does. Uh, but there is there are some provisions for uh, to encourage small business to get involved in voluntary standards development organizations like IEEE SA. Um, IEEE SA and IEEE USA have been working directly with legislators on many of these bills, uh, and. Uh, have done, a, I think, a pretty good job at educating legislators about what standards are, how they work, how they're developed, uh, and how they fit into the economy. So NDAA at the moment looks like it's on track to pass later this year, but there's a long way between here and there where things can go wrong. Uh, this bill becomes a very attractive vehicle for, say, an infrastructure bill should the infrastructure bill fail, or for provisions that are stripped out of the Reconciliation Act. Um, to lower the cost. So we shall see. A couple hearings of note. The first two are particularly interesting. Uh, protecting our kids online, Facebook, Instagram, and mental health harms, and protecting kids online testimony from a Facebook whistleblower. You will note, first of all, the first one of those happened this morning, and the recording of it should be up tomorrow on the Senate Commerce, Science, and Transportation Committee website. Uh, the second one is Tuesday, uh, but it's the same committee. And both of these are in response to a report that I mentioned in our last update. Uh, it was a leaked internal Facebook report that found that Instagram in particular was harmful to children, teenagers. Congress is jumping on that. Now, Facebook has come out and said, well, well, we've done a lot of research, and some of it says that Instagram and social media is harmful. Other research is inconclusive, so we can't actually say. That, by the way, is a very weak argument. <laughs> and the fact that the Senate is doing two hearings, and based on how they're, you know, titled, uh, it suggests that Congress is not buying it uh, and is going to be looking at uh, enacting legal uh, protections for children on social media. Um, another hearing in the House, balancing open science and security with the U.S. research enterprise. Uh, that is looking at... Over the last several years, uh, the Justice Department has conducted a number of investigations into researchers for their relationship with other countries, particularly China. Uh, a number of researchers have been charged. Some of them have been found guilty. It's worth noting most of those investigations have been dropped or fell apart, uh, and so most of them came to nothing. Um, but the House Science, uh, Space, and Technology Committee wants to look into it wants to see if there's a problem and if laws have to be changed to protect uh, research from being stolen and to protect researchers um, from arbitrary, overzealous prosecution, depending on one's perspective. And there is a problem here. The rules for how researchers have to handle sensitive material uh, are vague. Uh, and reporting requirements, you know, if you get funding from a foreign government when you have to report it, there's a lot of confusion about what's actually required. So clarifying the rules would be useful here. Um, but that's what House is looking into. 
There's additionally a UN uh, uh, event this afternoon uh, looking at addressing challenges and maximizing opportunities for artificial intelligence, uh, looking at AI ethics, uh, which should be quite interesting. I want to draw your attention to a conference, an IEEE conference that will be held next week. Uh, IEEE Future Directions has pulled together a conference on digital privacy uh, the 7th and 8th of October, the end of next week. Uh, this is a virtual conference. It is free, so everyone is welcome to attend. Uh, but it is an attempt by IEEE to start to focus attention on the technical aspects of digital privacy, not merely asserting that people should have privacy online, but what exactly does that look like, how exactly can you do that, and how can you ensure that people's privacy is maintained. There was a, uh, Future Directions did a roundtable in August, kind of starting this conversation. This two-day workshop will continue it. And I'm drawing your attention to it because I think this is an important conversation. I think IEEE and IEEE members in particular have a fairly substantial role that we could play in the national and global debate over digital uh, privacy. And I'm also speaking at it, which, you know, means it, it's got to be a cool conference. So I invite, invite you all to attend. The website's on the screen there. Or you can just uh, uh, do a Google search for IEEE Digital Privacy Workshop uh, and you'll be able to find it. Next update is October 14th. That is the day before we might hit the debt ceiling, so that should be quite exciting. Hopefully not, but if they haven't got the debt ceiling fixed by then, things could be quite entertaining, especially if you don't have money in a 401k. Uh, and with that, oops, let me do this first. Um, please feel free to put any questions about anything I talked about or anything I didn't talk about that you want me to touch on in your chat, and I will rotate to that in just a second. While you're doing that, I am Russell Harrison, Director of Government Relations for IEEE USA in Washington. My phone number is 202-530-8326. My email address is r.t for thomas.harrison at IEEE.org. Uh, feel free to reach out any time if you have any questions about anything the U.S. federal government, your state or local government are doing, uh, or that IEEE should be doing in response. And now I will stop sharing. There we go, and look to questions. Lots of questions here. Uh, oh, uh, Brendan Godfrey reminds us all, apparently the IEEE elections are ending today. Uh, as someone who spends a lot of time paying attention to you know, American elections, I try very hard not to pay attention to IEEE elections because I'm not a staff, I'm not involved. Um, but deadline is today. Please vote for the future of IEEE. Let's see. Questions, questions. Uh, the current status of the UCEDA bill in the House uh, from Will Robinson, our Vice President of Government Relations. Um, that was wrapped into the infrastructure bill. Um, the Senate has passed, that's the Endless Frontier Act, they renamed it for some bizarre reason, which is still a live bill, um, but the House hasn't taken it up yet. Uh, and so the key provisions were tucked into the infrastructure bill. Some of them, as I talked about earlier, have been tucked into reconciliation. If those two bills don't move, the original UCEDA bill can be brought back up again. It's live until the end of next year. Uh, and so once we get past the reconciliation debate, once the infrastructure bill is passed, we can look and see what managed to get through, because you know all the provisions are still moving around, see what didn't, and then can come back and try to get anything that didn't get passed squeezed through afterwards. Uh, so UCEDA is part of the current debate, but it's not part of the debate as UCEDA. It's been broken into pieces, which is fine as long as it becomes law. Um, let's see. Yeah, the hearing links, uh, Mr. Calera, um, I don't put links in my presentation because links to Hill things are just a mess. Uh, and so if I posted the actual link on the screen, it'd be a string of just random letters and numbers. Um, and and putting embedding a link in the text doesn't work in this format particularly well. Um, but if you want to email me, I can send you the links that way. And I think my colleagues, uh, Jonathan Cho, who's my producer, who's working very hard in the background, is taking care of that as well. 
and oh, there's lots of comments, but we don't have a tremendous number of questions, which is fine. Um, okay, just checking. If there's nothing else, as always, if something comes up in the next two weeks that you would like clarity on, feel free to reach out. Uh, it is always a pleasure and an honor to speak with you at these updates. Uh, I'm Russ Harrison. Uh, I can be reached at the number and email on your screen, and please reach out anytime. Hope you enjoy your fall, and I look forward to talking with you again in two weeks. Thank you for joining us today. I had the coolest job that any electrical engineer could ever have on the ground crew for Solar Impulse 2, the first solar-powered airplane to fly around the world only using the power of the sun. IEEE USA has given me a competitive edge because of their support system. It is so much easier doing something and being out of your comfort zone when you have someone there saying, you got this. IEEE USA is more than just a network. It's a family.